Welcome, everybody, to another Facing Future programme. My name is Rupert Reid. I'm your chair for this afternoon. Joining us today is, on my right, Dale Walkenon, the executive producer of Facing Future TV and a former professor of communications. And on my left, uh, Brian Wright, associate producer of Facing Future TV. In this session, we're going to be discussing the urgent matter of uh, adaptation. Adaptation transformative and deep. We're going to be thinking about what, about what adaptation is and why is it so important and urgent. So, why is it so important and urgent? Well, it's because the world has left it too late to be able to prevent the climate crisis. The crisis is here. Even today, right now, in the UK, we're having very unusual, unseasonable amounts of uh, rainfall and heavy winds, which have se seriously disrupted transport on the way up to COP26. And that's nothing compared to what many other countries in the global north, let alone the global south, have experienced uh, in this year. It's too late to think that we can prevent the climate crisis. We have to adapt to the climate chaos that is here and the worse climate chaos that is coming. That is why it's a good thing that adaptation is a central theme at this year's COP for the first time. And I would argue that actually adaptation should be the central theme. So this is the context for our urgent discussion here this afternoon. I'm first going to turn to Brian, who's going to speak with you about the ethical, spiritual, psychological dimensions of this crisis and why this is an absolutely important aspect of adaptation, which is why we're considering it first. Brian. Thank you. I'm going to take a step back and look about how did this existential crisis come about? I think it came about because of a loss of connection, a separation, a separation between us and them, me and it, or more generally, an immoral force that leads us on a downward path towards dissolution and extinction. The history of this civilization is one of lack of unity, alienation. That's alienation from other human beings, in conflict and wars, in exploitation and slavery, for example, in the sugar um, industry and the uh, early part of the Industrial Revolution, that exploitation and slavery was extreme. We lost our connection with nature. We've exploited the earth for profit and we've polluted and damaged the biosphere. As individuals, we've been alienated from our true, true nature, or soul. We have projected our divine spark in each one of us into an absent God or a historical figure no longer with us, or we have uh, denied the spiritual aspect and become materialistic and non-believers in anything beyond materialism. So I would argue that what we need now is a clear ethical foundation uh, for a transformation to unity for ourselves individually, for our communities, and for humanity uh, in order to find a way through the crisis for the whole planet. In the ethics of unity, the state of alienation is analyzed into nine aspects, including immaturity, narcissism, and denial. We discover our own immoral behavior by understanding our own experience, observing our own experience, and transforming it into an ethical force. States of self-responsibility, integrity, and perseverance. These, these states, these nine states, can be unified together in a statement of unity as such. And what that gives us is, a tr is the ability to transform our whole lives as individuals into the great strength of an ethical force, an eth ethical foundation that gives us absolute confidence in the way that we act in our lives, the way that we join with others to um, 
to advance the, our ability to deal and adapt to the crisis, and it, on a, on a bigger scale, uh, allows humanity as a whole to face uh, this enormous existential crisis with unity, enables us to, uh, to produce laws and to produce a way of working together, such as in the, these climate talks here, uh, for the um, policy makers and leaders of our world to actually make an agreement and carry out actions that can address the, the crisis. Brian, thank you so much. Now, Dale Walkinen is going to take us a bit more into the substance of what adaptation means in practical terms. She's going to follow up one of those ethical implications by speaking to us about the food supply issues that we are bound to have in the coming years, and in particular about the implications of industrial agriculture and animal agriculture. Dale. Thanks, Rupert. Food scarcity is a problem in many countries in the world already, and food shortages are coming everywhere as climate change worsens. Yet we are using 80% of our arable land to grow 15% of our food in the form of meat, dairy, fish. We've lost three quarters of the wildlife in the world since 1970 because we have destroyed their habitat in order to graze our favorite food animals. We have also wiped out uh, animals by destroying the soils when we grow genetically modified crops, which partner with pesticides and fertilizers, we destroy soil organisms that we need in order to be healthy. And we've been doing this for years. We subsidize animal agriculture. We subsidize our own destruction. One of the simplest things that people can do, they can do it without any money being involved is to stop eating animals. Everyone says, oh, this is impossible. It will never happen. People won't do that. We can't do that. We must do that. And that is the easiest thing that we could do to adapt to climate change and even to somewhat reverse the possibilities of climate change. Our carbon sinks are essential. No technology can match the Earth in terms of sequestering carbon. We need our trees, we need our soils, and we need our oceans if we are to sequester the carbon we have already put in the atmosphere. But our society is distracted. People are entertaining themselves, people are traveling, people are absorbed in their families, which is understandable. Our cultural norms are all about eating meat. We have Thanksgiving, we must have a turkey, we must have a roast pig, we must have fish for certain holidays. We need local food systems. We need not to be transporting food across great distances, and especially, we need not to be refrigerating all this meat. Refrigerating food is an enormous climate disaster, but this is something that we could comfortably stop doing, is uh, just stop eating animals. Thanks, Dale. Yes, in a few minutes we will have a, a short discussion among ourselves in the spirit of the way that these press conferences at these uh, COPs give us the opportunity to go a little bit deeper than the day-to-day -day news does into the vital issues of our time. So let me start by asking this. Why is it that adaptation hasn't got the attention that mitigation and prevention have done uh, historically so far, and that's only now starting to change? There are a number of reasons for this, but I think that the two most crucial reasons are these. Firstly, some people have equated adaptation with giving up, uh, and they've thought that it was sort of immoral almost to engage in adaptation because you were giving away uh, the, the idea of mitigation or prevention. Uh, and secondly, uh, adaptation has had a, a hard time because some of its proponents uh, have not exactly covered themselves in glory. So uh, one of the participants in uh, COP26 here, of course, will be the Australian government of Scott Morrison, uh, which made an interesting flip uh, last year from um, a position of denial of the climate science altogether to a position of saying, well, climate change is here, there's not much we can do about it, so we just have to adapt to it. And what 
the Australian government means by adaptation is things like more air conditioning, uh, higher seawalls. Um, you can see why that kind of um, response to the situation uh, looks like a, a sort of a kind of giving up uh, and could give adaptation a bad name. But as I said at the start, it is too late now not to adapt. We cannot stick our heads in the sand any longer and pretend that climate, climate chaos is not here. We've all seen, for example, the Australian wildfires unprecedented, the North American heat dome utterly unprecedented, the unprecedented floods in Germany. This country in the UK has got off lightly so far. That luck will not hold. Therefore, it is time for adaptation. But in the light of what I've already said, it becomes absolutely critical to define adaptation adequately so that it's not equated with giving up and so that it's not seen as a kind of um, way of avoiding the hard work of mitigation and prevention. So what does that take us to? Well, what it takes us to is what the UN has called transformative adaptation, which basically means that we're moving more towards a system change type approach, the kind of thing that um, Dale is getting at um, in her remarks vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the food system. Um, and in terms of uh, flooding, um, it would mean rather than building hard flood defenses only, you would be looking, for example, to reconstruct, to recreate wetlands, to recreate mangrove swamps, to work with nature rather than against nature. This can also at the same time sequester carbon. So transformative adaptation uh, is about uh, integrating mitigation and adaptation together. They're not alternatives. It's not a matter of an either or. And it also tragically means deep adaptation, which we put in the media advisory for this uh, session because we think it's absolutely critical that this idea gets an outing here at the UN. Um, I've uh, just edited this book with Jem Bendel, the founder of the concept of deep adaptation. It's called Deep Adaptation. The first book on the topic, what is deep adaptation? Well, deep adaptation is adaptation that goes beyond transformative adaptation by actually readying us also for the possible collapse of our societies. And tragically, that is not a discussion we can avoid any longer. We are so far down the track now and, and so inadequately prepared that we have to be ready for the potentiality of societal collapse. If we're not and societies do collapse, that will be far worse than if we are ready. So transformative and deep adaptation, if we frame adaptation in that exciting new lens, then we will be well-placed, or at least relatively well-placed, to move into the, the terrible storms uh, that are coming as our climate deteriorates uh, for a good while longer, however well we do at mitigation and prevention. Okay, as promised, we're now going to have a short discussion among the three of us here, uh, and we will then uh, allow the opportunity, if anyone in the room has a, a question, so please be thinking of your questions, if you have a question, based on what we've said so far, uh, and I will repeat any questions to make sure that they're picked up by the microphones and cameras. Uh, Dale or Brian, which of you would like to uh, briefly uh, take us a uh, little further forward in this discussion? Well, I'd like to just talk a little bit about consumerism, which is a sort of a galloping disease in our culture where we buy and sell, and this is what our culture consists of. Instead of a culture consisting of people getting together in community, we've really focused our attention on gadgets which brings the idea of China. We blame China, uh, we blame other countries for their pollution. But it's really the wealthy countries, ironically, who are buying all these gadgets and cheap products uh, and not seeing the pollution that they're creating because we've shipped it to the other side of the world. What we don't look at, we don't care about. So we don't look at animal suffering in, in industrial agriculture. If people saw what it looks like in an animal confinement operation, or what it looks like to see a veal calf in a small crate, um, or what it looks like for pigs to raise their young in a very small crate, they wouldn't eat it. No one would eat it. It would be just disgusting. Uh, we don't see it. We don't think about it. We don't see the suffering of the rest of the world. Only when it comes to our doorstep, only when Angela Merkel is deep in <laughs> floodwaters does she realize that it's going to come to Germany. It's not just going to come to Bangladesh. And in our own countries, we have, we're going to see it coming to our doorstep. How far does it have to come? How, many, how deep does the floodwater have to get before we say, gee, you know, we could 
stop eating the animals, and that would immensely help the climate. We could stop overfishing, and that would help the oceans. The oceans are a major carbon sink. Yeah, I, I guess one um, key aspect of this for me is that what you're saying there, uh, Dale, brings to the fore the way that if you talk about adaptation and if you do adaptation, uh, it's a way of bringing home to ourselves the reality of the crisis, the reality of the vulnerability that we are now in as a result of our inaction for so long and as a result also of habitat destruction, as you were mentioning, uh, for example. Yeah? If, we, if we spend all our time focusing on thinking about net zero 2050, it still makes it sound as if the crisis is a long way down the road. Putting it in terms of our vulnerability and the need to adapt to cope with uh, that vulnerability makes it much more uh, present uh, and psychologically and practically real to us. I think this is absolutely crucial at this point and could also be crucial for focusing our attention on the, of course, ongoing need to uh, mitigate and prevent. Brian. I'd like to uh, really emphasize um, the fact that all the trends are going towards not just a, a gradual slip into uh, dysfunction, but, a, but something that could happen and is happening quite suddenly. I mean, the weather events, the fires, um, the big changes are coming thick and fast, and they're not just gradually warming or gradually having a, a, a small fire here or there. The, the changes were unpredictable. They weren't predicted, and they've happened already. So I'm looking into the future and seeing that the crisis could come on us very suddenly. And what this means, I think, is that the pressure for, uh, to, to come to agreement is more than just a, a movement starting and spreading gradually. It has to be a complete change. One of the um, very ancient Chinese sayings was that a, a change in the world can only come about by a moral change. And that's what I want to emphasize here is that it is a change of point of view that we all have to go through individually. And I'm sure many people at this conference have gone through that change, but many haven't. And some, some of those people who haven't uh, gone through the change of seeing that a crisis is upon us are in, in the conference uh, as delegates and resisting uh, even the slightest movement towards uh, rapid change. So um, what I'm urging here, I guess, is a, a complete rethink of our position individually and in our communities and groups, organizations, and to, uh, to really find the, the pivot point that we can change our direction as a humanity. Mm. Yeah, uh, so the, the reality of what, most of what's happening at COP26 clearly is that it's an attempt to prop up the existing system. Mm -hmm. And shallow, defensive, incremental adaptation, such as that favored by Australia, but frankly that favored by most um, governments in the world um, to date, uh, is quite clearly an attempt to continue to prop up that system. But the system is becoming more and more fragile. And this is why it is so critical that the conversation turns in the direction of transformative adaptation, including in its psychological, spiritual, and ethical uh, dimensions, including as those dimensions are applied on the ground through, for example, changes to our food system to make it less fragile and more uh, humane. Um, and, well, I guess this is why uh, we think that uh, the topic of this press conference this afternoon is of very great importance. So as, I, as promised, I'd like to throw it open for a moment to the floor now. If there are one or two uh, questions, we can, uh, we can succinctly uh, take those questions. Please indicate in the usual manner if you have a question or a comment you would like to uh, put to the panel here. You mentioned the importance of um, refraining from eating animals and animal products. But in order to do that, we'd have to counter a tremendous amount of misinformation put forth by our governments that's saying that these foods are necessary for our health and well-being. So this is quite a challenge, and how do you think that we can um, overcome these mismessages in order to do what you suggest is necessary for the planet? 
Well, the myth that we need animal protein has been promulgated by advertising, and it's in our food graphs of what you need to eat. Lobbying is a huge issue, as we know, um, and getting fighting the lobbyists is very difficult. I was once a lobbyist for the ASPCA, and I know directly how hard it is to counteract their message, which has a lot of money behind it. It's money it is behind it, but you know the message of look people, show people, documentaries, these kind of panels, uh, see what's happening. You know, because you're, it's behind a closed door, you don't see the suffering, but if you see the suffering, I really think there is something in human beings that responds to that suffering, if, if it's seen, if we allow ourselves to look at it, see spiracy, cowspiracy, eating our way to extinction. These are wonderful documentaries that everyone should take a look at. It's just a duty as, as human beings to understand the situation. Um, as Greta Thunberg says, you know, educate yourself, educate yourself, educate yourself. That's the first thing to do. And that's our best hope. Um, if we are to move to a more compassionate society, a better world, that's what we're talking about in adaptation. Not preserving the world as it is, which is polluting and destroying uh, rivers, oceans, land. We don't want that to continue. How could that continue indefinitely? It would get worse and worse and worse even if we were to take the carbon out of the air. So we need to think about, in, in our towns, in our cities, in our local governments, how can we change our societies? What would a better world look like? What would be the good, what do we want to keep in our society? What are the important things? And what can we let go of? What kinds of things do we not need? That's what we need to look at, and that's the way we change. Super. Time for one more question. Yes. I think it was H uh, Victor Hugo who said, nothing succeeds like an idea whose time has come. And this idea of unity is a very interesting idea, but do you think its time has come? And if not, when? Um, I'd like to take that. Yes, I think the time for unity has come because it's becoming so obvious that anything but unity is going to fail. And it is failing very fast, very frighteningly, uh, terrifyingly, I would say. Um, the only response that we can make is one that comes uh, as a result of, of seeing how bad the situation is and deciding that the only way of, of having a future for generations to come, our children, grandchildren, and even ourselves, we have to make the change now, and that is a change that has to be agreed upon by at least a majority of, the, of humanity, mm -hmm. and hopefully um, that majority becomes the whole of humanity, seeing that we need to um, go beyond our alienation, our dishonesty, our, our apathy, uh, our, all the negative and uh, immoral um, behaviors and attitudes that can be easily transformed by looking at ourselves honestly and making that change to say, yes, I want to be uh, a part of the, uh, a unified humanity who is going to make a, a enough change to survive and to allow the biosphere as a whole to survive. Mm. Yes, and perhaps as we move towards a close here, I could just uh, add to that, that this COP, there are very high expectations for it. I predict that those expectations are not going to be met. And as this COP disappoints the world, I believe there is a chance to grow some of that unity to which Brian is referring as people come to realize that our governments are not going to save us and we're going to have to initiate some of this transformative adaptation, this system change that we've all been talking about for ourselves. That will be an enormous task and there will be grave difficulties along the way, but I think gradually you will get a greater and greater accretion of people who realize this truth and are willing to face it. And eventually they will become the majority and then the overwhelming majority. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, well then all that will be left is deep adaptation. 
Thank you very much for being here uh, this afternoon. Thank you for our sponsors, without which it's not possible to have this event. The International Society for Ecological Economics, the Sustainable Population Australia Group, Interfaith Centre for Sustainable Development, the Buddhist Su Chi Foundation. Thank you for help in making this programme possible. Thank you all very much for attending. Uh, my name's Rupert Reid. We've been Facing Future TV, and we hope that you will take this vital message, we believe, from this panel today uh, and share it widely. This is something that needs to be heard inside the UN. It's something that needs to be heard across the world. Uh, and the responsibility for that rests upon the shoulders of each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you.